Have you ever been on a trip where you had everything you needed? Everything you needed you had. Maybe you were visiting someone and they hosted you and they, they took such good care of you, they had thought of every little detail. They had extra toothbrushes. They put a chocolate on your pillow. Maybe they, they borrowed some friends' bikes so that your whole family can ride bikes with them. Maybe they knew you had a food allergy, allergy so they got a, a special breakfast thing for you. Extra swimsuits, extra hiking shoes. They even had glasses in your prescription. Okay, maybe, that, maybe that's a little bit too much. But everything was provided for you to have an absolutely wonderful stay. And then, when you got ready to leave, they drew you a hand-drawn map how to get back to the interstate in the most efficient way possible. They indicated the best rest areas, the best rest, uh, restaurants, the best gas stations on the way home. They helped you navigate road construction, and they packed you a snack pack to nosh on on your way home. Even though you're leaving their house, their care for you and their provision continues and sets you up to have the best trip possible, to stay focused on your mission of getting home. You know, some folks in our church show hospitality like that. Maybe not exactly to that degree that I said, but that heart of, of caring for other people, even when they're not right in front of you, is often on display amongst our church family. And I believe that displays Christ-likeness, a care and a provision for others. As we have gotten to the end of the book of John, we have seen and we will continue to see the amazing provision of Christ, the the care for his disciples, a care for his flock in a way that, that resonates his love and compassion that was in place before the cross, displayed amazingly at the cross, but continues even in the resurrected Lord, even before and after he ascends to heaven. Now, as many of you know, this annual theme this year is enjoying life in his name. We've been studying verse by verse the gospel of John, and today is the end of that series. We see that John writes his gospel to testify to the person and work of Christ that people would believe he is the Christ, the Messiah, the the Son of God, and that by believing they may have life in his name. And so today, as we end our series on the Gospel of John, we will focus on enjoying life in his name through the ongoing provision of Christ. Uh, Please turn in your Bibles to John chapter 21, the last chapter in the book of John. If you need a Bible, there's one under the chair in front of you. Please turn to page 90 in the back section, the New Testament. We're going to be reading John chapter 21 in its entirety. Please turn there in your Bibles, on your apps, in some way, shape, or form. John 21. After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And he manifested himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana of Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will also come with you. They went out and got into the boat and that night they caught nothing. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, children, you do not have any fish, do you? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find a catch. So they cast and there they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards away, dragging the net full of fish. So when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. 
Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land, full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him, who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourselves and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. The one who also had leaned back on his bosom at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? So Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, and what about this man? Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Therefore, this saying went out among the brethren that the, that disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. As we consider our Lord's amazing provision, let's consider first Christ's provision of manifesting himself. Christ making himself known over and over and over again strengthens our faith. We see in the book of John that Christ appeared three times after the resurrection to the disciples, the apostles. John 21. Hmm. John 21. After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And he manifested himself in this way. John 21, 14, same thing. This is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. John emphasized this is the third time, but we understand that he appeared to them over the course of 40 days, Acts 1, 9, explain this with with many convincing proofs, but we know for sure as John talks about these, this is the third instance. This is not the first time they are seeing the resurrected Lord, and I think this repeated over and over manifesting of himself provides the disciples with their strength to their faith to be strengthened. It helps them realize this is not a dream, this is not a hallucination, this is real. This is the resurrected Messiah appearing over and over and over. And this would have strengthened their faith and it strengthens our faith. This is not a one-time situation to one person, but over and over again to multiple people. In fact, we see Christ's followers still struggle, still struggle to, to recognize Jesus, to see him. At the end of the gospel, we see a struggle of belief. Did Jesus really do what he said he was going to do? Did he really resurrect? 
ultimately, when the Holy Spirit comes upon them at Pentecost, they are going to be empowered, empowered to be his witnesses. But they are witnesses to the fact that he resurrected and appeared in the flesh repeatedly. He doesn't just give them one instance, but he does it over and over again to strengthen their testimony. In fact, we learn it's not just seven, not just 12, not just one, but a huge amount. Paul later in 1 Corinthians 15 says this, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. He was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And then he appeared to Cephas, another name for Peter, Cephas, then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Some have died. If people had questions, they could go and talk to some of these people and get an eyewitness testimony of someone who's still alive, who saw the resurrected Messiah. Trusting in the resurrected Messiah requires faith. It requires belief, but it is a reasonable belief that is based on eyewitness testimony that did not just happen once, did not just happen to one person, but repeatedly to multiple people, 500 at one time. And what's the point? The Lord has provided a solid foundation for people to believe in him. It is a reasonable faith the Lord has provided us to trust in. He's also provided for the disciples with the provision of the bread and the fish. We see here in John 21, he's meeting with seven of the disciples who have gone fishing. And he makes them breakfast. Now we know from the other gospels in Mark 14, 28, that they were supposed to go to Galilee. After I've been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Or Matthew 28, 16. But the 11 disciples proceed to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. Now, some commentators point out, wait a second. It says the mountain of Galilee. They were not at the mountain. They were at the lake. They're not where they're supposed to be. Well, they're at Lake Tiberias, and Lake Tiberias is another name for Lake Galilee. They're at Galilee. They're not on the mountain. Doesn't seem like they're exactly where they're supposed to be. And this is where Peter says, I'm going fishing. Now, is this Peter being impatient? Just waiting for Jesus to come and passing the time to go fishing? Or is he saying, I'm going back to fishing as my life's profession? Regardless of exactly where Peter is at in his heart, we see Jesus patiently, lovingly, again, redirecting them to himself, demonstrating again who he is, showing another miracle where now all of the fish are caught when all night long they have caught nothing. You fish at night, so you can then catch the fish and sell them in the morning at the market. And so they've been fishing all night long. After they catch this fish, because Jesus says, put your net on the other side of the boat, which reminds us when, they first, when he first called them in the other gospels, after the fish are caught, John says to Peter, it's the Lord. They now see that's the Lord. Who else would have brought all these fish it's the Lord. And Peter is so excited. Don't you love Peter? He gets so excited. He throws on some clothes and he throws himself into the sea. Again, it reminds us when Jesus called them in the other gospels to put their net on their side of the fish. It reminds us when Peter jumped into the sea before in a storm to go to Jesus don't you just envision Peter as a man of action? Do you have like a, a clear vision of what Peter was like? I'm going fishing. Now I'm going swimming. I mean, he's just quick to change his mind. He abandons fishing just as quickly as he took it back up. But as we will see, the Lord is going to task him with a mission that will require more faithfulness and less impulsiveness. 
I think we can also make the point that after a long night of catching no fish, then having a massive catch and having to drag that to shore, they would be hungry. They'd be, they'd be hungry. And I don't want to miss the obvious point that Jesus provided for them by giving them food, nourishment. He is serving them yet again. He has washed their feet. He has went to the cross to die for their sins. He has revealed himself multiple times saying that, showing that what he said he was going to do, he has done. And now he is feeding them, providing for them. And he's going to call them to feed his sheep, to provide for his sheep in his name. The disciples are going to be a conduit of his provision to others. As we progress through this text, I think it's good for us to apply it, uh, to ask ourselves, in my daily life, in your daily life, are you a, a conduit of God's provision to other people? Do you appreciate what the Lord has done so much for you, what he's provided for you, that you want to be a conduit of provision towards others? You, you want to love God and you want to love others in his name. When people walk away from a conversation with you, are they built up, nourished, encouraged? Or does your complaining, your critical spirit, what you choose to talk about do the opposite? Christ provides and he uses his people as conduits of his provision. And I think this breakfast also provides us with a reminder. It reminds us of, of, of what Jesus has done and said throughout the whole Gospel of John. The breakfast of bread and fish reminds us of the miracles Jesus did reveal himself as the Messiah, one involving bread and fish. John 6, 9 through 14. There's a lad here with 5,000 people, right? There's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are these for so many people? Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Jesus took the loaves, having given thanks, he distributed to those who were seated, likewise also the fish, as much as they want. As, just let that sink in, as much as they want. There's not enough for everybody to have a tiny bit. As much as they wanted. When they were filled He said to his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. So he gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. Some people ask, well, 153 fish, what's the significance of 153? 12 baskets, what's the significance of 12 baskets? Here's the significance we know. There were a lot. There was plenty. That's what we know for sure. And you know, fish, any good fisherman, right? They count their fish, right? There's a lot of fish there. How many are there? 153. It just tells us the Lord's provision is massive. They were filled. Nobody goes away from breakfast with Jesus hungry. Jesus provides. A few verses later in John 6, he takes it to another realm, uh, uh, another way of focusing the provision of the Lord. Jesus answered them and said, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father God has set his seal. And therefore they said to him, what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent Jesus wants his disciples, all of his disciples, 
to come to him for provision. And the ultimate provision is that you believe in him who he has sent. That you believe Jesus is the Messiah sent to bring us eternal life. We can't work our way to heaven. The only work, in quotes, that we can do is to believe in the work someone else has done in our place. If you have never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, I would hope the whole gospel of John has led you to see Christ with new eyes. Eyes of faith that believe in him as your personal Lord and your Savior, that he died on the cross for you to pay for your sins, but he did not stay dead. He was buried, yes, but he resurrected again and revealed himself to many, many people indicating that he did exactly what he said he would do and he has the authority over life and death and he has the authority to forgive you of your sins and transfer you from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. I pray that those who have heard the gospel of John over and over again indeed believe and enjoy life in his name. Through the whole book of John, Jesus has been revealing himself to the people over and over and over again. We see that in the seven I am statements. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. The door of the sheep. The good shepherd. The resurrection and the life. The way, the truth, and the life. The true vine when we add all of these up together, when we think about all we've learned from the Gospel of John, one message resonates very, very clearly. Jesus is the only one who can truly provide. He's the vine. He is the way. He is the door. He is the only one who can provide salvation. The only one who can provide eternal life. And the only one who can truly provide for our everyday needs. Not just physically, but also spiritually. So my question to you, is that your view of Christ? Have you cultivated that view of Christ? Did you think about all the I am statements we've studied? That he provides for you abundantly. Or are you constantly looking for more from other sources? When we talk about the baskets of food or the massive catch of 153 fish, where the nets don't break, we see again and again and again and again that Jesus provides abundantly. The Messiah is entirely satisfying. There is is plenty for all to be filled. And so he is inviting men and women and children to, to come to him and to enjoy life in his name because of his abundant provision. Provision that no one else and nothing else can provide. In fact, Jesus has been revealing himself from the beginning of John to be like no other. Nothing else compares to Jesus because he is God taken on human flesh. You see, Jesus displayed the glory of God and the way of salvation. At the very beginning, he says, and the word became flesh The word is God, right? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the father full of grace and truth. Or it goes earlier to say, in him was life. And the life was the light of man. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. John the Baptist, you're not the apostle John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. Jesus is the light, the light of men. He reveals, light reveals, it shows what actually is, what actually is true about God, about man, And about how sinful man can have a relationship with the holy God. 
Not only does Christ reveal what is true, he has the authority to save, to rescue. John 1, 12 says, as many as received him, who believed what he said, believed what he did, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Jesus reveals what is true. He is the light. He exposes sin. Light is good, but light also exposes what is wrong. But it exposes the solution for our sin problem. And after people believe in him, after they become children of God, after they become his followers, after they get restored, reconciled to God, after he is not going to abandon them. He is going to continue to provide for them even when he leaves. We also see Christ's provision of shepherding for his flock. When Jesus talks to Peter, notice the emphasis on my sheep. Jesus is talking to Peter, but he's talking to Peter about his sheep, about Jesus' flock. This reminds us of the, the great care of the good shepherd. John 10, 11 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. <clears throat> I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Even as the father knows me, I know the father. I lay down my life for the sheep. Not only does Jesus lay down his life for his sheep, he's going to care for his sheep even after he leaves and ascends to heaven. And he's calling under shepherds to function under the chief shepherd to care for his flock. But as a part of this process, Peter, do you remember impetuous Peter? Peter must be restored. I learned a lot about Peter as I studied for this message. <clears throat> I find the fact uh, in John, Peter is often leading. Peter is an incredibly strong man. I think, I think Peter was ripped, if we can say it that way. Peter was incredibly strong and tough, a man of action. He was a leader. People follow him. I'm going fishing. Everybody's like, we're coming with you. He cut off the ear of a guy. He hauled the catch of 153 uh, fish. I almost said sheep. <laughs> that would be a really big thing to do. 153 fish, not sheep. He hauled that to shore by himself. This man is ripped. He also boasted a lot about how he would never turn from Christ and how he would lay down his life for Jesus. But in fact, he didn't do that at all. In fact, before the rooster crowed, Jesus was denied by Peter three times to save his own skin. And so now, Jesus is taking time to address this strong man, Peter, is sitting down with this gentle but heart-focused restoration. We see Jesus provides through the restoration of Peter. The text says, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, shepherd my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And this is the point that just gets me every time. Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Jesus nicknamed Peter uh, Rock. Peter was his nickname that Jesus had given him, Rock. Uh, but when Jesus is correcting him, he often uses his family name, Simon. Initially, Jesus asks if Peter loves Jesus more than, than these. People question 
exactly what he's referring to. Whether he is asking if Peter loves him, Jesus, more than he loves the other disciples, or is he asking if Peter loves Jesus more than the other disciples love Jesus because Peter often boasts that his fidelity is of a higher order than anybody else. Or perhaps Jesus is asking if Peter loves him more than these, the items laying about indicating Peter's fishing profession. And this makes sense contextually because Peter was just fishing and he just went fishing. But the point is that Jesus got to Peter's heart. We finally see Peter grieve when Jesus asks him a third time. And I believe this points back to the three times that Peter denied Christ before the rooster crowed. In response of this restoration, Peter does not boast. There is no impetuous declaration of how strong Peter is and how Peter will never mess up again. None of that. Just the affirmation that Jesus is the one who knows all things. There's no boasting, no bravado, no fooling the Lord. All that is left is humble faithful servant service in his name. A focus on who Jesus is rather than a focus on who Peter is. And I love that shift in Peter's focus. I'm never going to desert you. You are the one who knows all things. There's no boasting. There's just restoration. And Peter knows that Jesus sees his heart. There is a genuine love for Christ because of who he is, what he has done at the cross, and Peter is restored. But this restoration has purpose, greater purpose than just Peter. It it focuses on his vocation going forward, not fishermen, but fishers of men, not shepherds, but shepherds of the flock of God. Peter restores, God restores Peter but with a focus on providing for his people through Peter. The people the Lord is calling to himself through his death, his burial, his resurrection. And so Christ provides again through the instruction for shepherds. The two greatest commandments in the Bible are love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. If Peter and the other disciples are going to feed the sheep to care for others. They must do so out of a love for God. Our love for one another, our love for our neighbors must, must, must flow out of our love for God. If you love me, that's the logic here. If you love me, tend my lambs. If you love me, shepherd my sheep. If you love me, tend my sheep. John likes synonyms. He likes changing it up. Tend my lambs, shepherd my sheep, tend my sheep. What he is saying is feed and protect my people that I died for. I'm the good shepherd. You are the under shepherd. The book of Acts says it like this, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Peter later writes this himself, telling others, this is not just about Peter, it's for all the shepherds and Peter exhorts other overseers as well. I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God. Not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Peter was a leader for sure. 
But this was not just for Peter, but for all the apostles. And we see in the New Testament how pastors are called to shepherd the flock that God has entrusted to them. God's provision is on display even though we are waiting for his return. So Peter does not go back to fishing. He has been restored and he has a clear direction for what the Lord wants him to do with his life and even with his death. But (laughs) Peter still needs to grow. Peter still, Peter still gets a little bit distracted. But even in that, we see Christ's provision of a clear and focused mission. And this helps all of us. This helps all of us not be distracted In fact, it prepares us for trials, for persecution, and even for death. The Bible talks about how followers of Christ will endure suffering and trials and possibly even martyrdom, possibly even death. If we're to follow the suffering servant, we are going to suffer. And it's going to be a small taste of the amazing suffering that Christ took in your place. We see it said very succinctly in 2 Timothy 3.12, indeed all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So Jesus restores Peter, gives him and others pastoral marching orders. And he speaks about how Peter is gonna glorify God with his life at the end of his life, and even in his death. It seems as though Peter is going to be a prisoner, led around where he doesn't want to go. His arms are going to be stretched out. That seems to describe crucifixion. Peter's going to be crucified. Peter, the physically strong, ripped Peter, can do a lot of things. In the past, he's kind of done whatever he felt like doing. He's very impetuous. At the end of his life, he's not going to be able to do whatever he wants to do. He's going to be constrained. His will is constrained. And yet, he is still going to be able to glorify God even in his death. Because he's ultimately following Christ. And that's what we read about. This, he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Note how he says this twice. Peter, turning around, saw a disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back on his bosom at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, and what about this man? Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Follow me. He says it twice. Christ is preparing Peter to not just run the race well for a bit but all the way to the end of his life, even in his death. It's good for us to think about glorifying God all the way to the end, even at the end of our life. Follow Christ to the end. Peter is kind of like um, that dog in the movie Up. What's the dog's name again? Doug, you, yeah, you, you know this well. Squirrel, squirrel. You know, he's, he's focusing, he's been restored. And he's like, what about this guy over here? And Jesus is just, you follow me. Don't worry about what happens to him. You follow me. Christ's clear directive to Peter helps us as well. It provides us. It focuses us on the person of Christ instead of comparing our circumstances to others. Peter needs to keep growing. He needs to stay focused on Christ. John also appears to be addressing a misconception that everybody thinks John's not going to die until Jesus comes back. And John is like, that's not what Jesus said. What he said was, Peter, what is it to you if this happens? Not that it will happen. But think about Peter all that he's gone through, being restored, all that he's seen, the glory of God in the flesh, being distracted and comparing himself to others. Does anybody else besides me struggle with kind of looking over the the, the hedge 
looking over of what is going on in someone else's life and then starting to kind of compare it a little bit? Do we tend to be experts in comparing ourselves to other people? I believe that we are experts in the grass is a bit greener on the other side or, oh, that grass is terrible. My grass is better. We love to compare ourselves to other people and we lose focus on following Christ. How easy is it? To think, oh, at least they don't have it as bad as they do, or nobody has it as bad as I do. The Lord's response to Peter is instructive for us all. Do not compare yourself to others, period. Follow Christ. Keep your eyes fixed on him. Focus on the mission that he has given us each individually and us collectively to follow him and to, to trust him in whatever responsibilities he has entrusted to you. Whatever trial he has allowed for you to go through and even the way that he chooses for you to be ushered into his kingdom at the end of your life. What is that to you? You follow me. That was Jesus' response to Peter. And yet those words are instructive for us. Just as the author of Hebrews says, keep your eyes fixed on Christ. Jesus has said this over and over and over again. John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. John 8, 12, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. Mark 8, 34, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. As I end here, I want to challenge you and encourage you with one very clear thing, to follow Christ. Whatever you do in your life, whatever you think or you say, as you think about loving God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, you've got to ask yourself, is what I'm doing right now, right now, in my thoughts, with my words, with, with my actions, am I following Christ right now? Is that what I'm doing? Is this in line with the path that Christ walked is this humble? Is this serving others? Is this trusting the Father's plan? Is this submitting my will to the will of the Father? Am I following Christ right now, or am I kind of going wherever I feel like going? Does what I'm thinking about, does what I am saying, does this meet the criteria of following Christ? If not, I've lost my focus on Christ. I hope you ask yourself this week, multiple times a day, am I following Christ right now? What, what am, where, am I go, where, am I, where am I going right now? Am I following Christ right now? Whether it's an amazing, deep blessing and you have humility in it, or a deep, deep trial where you turn to the Lord in lamentation, or lamentation, both of those. <laughs> Is your commitment to follow Christ the same because of the provision of Christ? What he has done for you, you are laser focused on following him and not comparing yourself to others and not just unaware of where you are going. You are aware that you are following Christ. When you do that, you are in a good position to testify unto the amazing work of Christ as we're concluding the Gospel of John, I just want us to go back to the very beginning of John and think about the testimony of the disciple, uh, the, the John the Baptist, and then the, the end testimony of John the Apostle, and let their testimonies influence us to testify to the Lord as we follow Christ. John the Baptist's testimony. John testified about him and cried out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace, I love that, grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. John the Baptist was focused on Christ. 
That's John's testimony as well. This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and wrote these things. And we know his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Christ's fullness is on display. His amazing provision, grace upon grace, is on display. There's not enough books in the whole world that could capture all that Christ has done because he is God in the flesh. And we are to focus on him, all that he has done, and follow him and testify to the work he has done to others that they too might believe and have life in his name. I want to close with our key verse. And I'd like us to read it together, to close out together. So will you read this passage with me all together? Can I get a nod or two? All right. We're going to try to do it in a good cadence, and then I'll pray, and then we'll be done. Let's read this passage together. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Lord, thank you for your provision, revealing yourself over and over again, revealing yourself for 40 days by many convincing proofs that you indeed are the resurrected Messiah. Thank you for revealing over and over and over again with great clarity your great plan of salvation, that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one goes to the Father but through Jesus the Messiah. Lord, thank you so much for your provision of shepherds, that, that, that we have the ability to shepherd the flock. Lord, help us to do so with humility for your glory because you are the chief shepherd. Lord, thank you for all those throughout history who has, have testified to your great work. Lord, help us be a part of that array of witnesses who testify unto the work you have done in our hearts because we are focused on following you. And Lord, help us. Help us seek to follow you in our mind, with our words, in our relationships every day. And help us follow you because of the glory of the cross, because of the amazing provision of your death, your burial, your resurrection. And Lord, I pray that many would come to know you, to believe, and have life in your name. We pray all of this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.